Go ahead. Uh, we were assuming that uh, when you could set up a new studio. Yeah. So, so it's assumed that after like the capacity, the second studio is finished, they set up a third studio. Mm-hmm. Well, I I wouldn't carry this too far. I mean, how how many years are you carrying this forward? So I I would you know. Don't, don't pull this out to infinity, otherwise you'll be building studio after studio for content that might never may, be bought. I may be wrong here, but at a 20% growth rate for the Asia studio, I was having like three studios in 10 years if I'm also doing this. Uh, there's, some, there's something wrong. I mean, um, I'll send out a clarification. The, um, the, uh, the content for the fitness stays at 30%, it doesn't grow. So maybe that's what's causing you to have multiple studios. So. Maybe, maybe I'm messing something up. Okay, I'll send some clarification on that. Okay, folks, it's um, 10.30 New York time, 7.30 my time. God only knows what your time is. I hope you're all safe and and um, and well. But I'm going to get started because, um, you know, people will join in as we go along. And um, I'm going to start with, the, you know, oh, by opening for questions. In fact, the first question came in about the Netflix studio. So I'll send out a clarification email today about what you should be looking at in the case. And just to be clear, if you can work as a group, that'll be great and turn in a group case analysis. It means, you know, it's easier for me to deal with, you know, 80 cases than 200 and something cases. But if you are isolated, you can't get through to your group, you're in a time zone that makes it impossible and you want to turn it in as an individual analysis, I would take that as well. But um, let me open with any questions from Monday's class, any left, I mean, pretty much anything to do with what we've done so far. Um, Professor, I have a question with regards to Monday's class. Yeah. I was calculating the ROI of the company. Uh-huh. And, uh, Uh huh. So for Nike's case, the book value of equity turned out to be just three million. Uh huh. Which is why my denominator is coming out to be negative. Yeah, then the return on invested capital becomes meaningless. So just yeah, let it go. So what do I do? No, you can't compute a return on invested capital. Part of the reason it's probably a book. We, remember, we said book. You know, whenever you use book equity, you're affected by all the things that the company has done. Nike's probably done enough buybacks to make its book equity a really, really small number. So unless you want to go back in time and reverse all of that stuff, your conclusion will be return vested capital is not meaningful. Therefore, we you know you can't draw a conclusion from the return vested capital. You have to look for other clues. Does Nike have good investments? So I think that you know that, that that there are enough clues in Nike's financial statements that you can because ultimately, what's the question you're trying to answer? Are my company's existing investments good investments? Really, that's all you're trying to answer. If return invested capital gives you some sense of that, you'll use it. If not, try to use other clues. And look at their profitability, look at their margins, look at them relative to their peer group. I mean, there are other peer, there are, there are other clues you can look at to see are they taking good investments. Okay. Okay, folks. Welcome and um, we're going to get started. So if you remember last session, we were talking about the Disney theme park. We've been talking about it for, for a couple of sessions, but I did the net present value and the internal rate of return for the theme park. Let me review what we found. We found that if I discount back the expected cash flows, including that giant in the room, that terminal value, at the 8.46% theme park cost of capital, which includes the country risk, I come up with a net present value of $3.2 billion. That basically tells me not only that this project is a good project, but if I take it, you know, Disney's value as a company will increase by $3.2 billion. Then I did the internal rate of return, and I did it in a, in, a, in a way that might not be, you know, familiar to some of you. I just did what's called a net present value profile. Nothing fancy. I just plotted the net present value as a function of the discount rate to see where the net present value became zero. And my internal rate of return was 12.6%. Yes, I did press the record button. Thank you, Emily. In fact, I, if, if somebody would remind me at the start of every one of these Zoom classes to hit the record button, that would be incredible because I have a list of eight things I need to do before every class and sometimes I forget one. So this is, ge- this is getting recorded. So, so returning in, the net present value is positive. The internal rate of return of 12.6% was also higher than the cost of capital. The project was a good project. 
But before I get too carried away, I mean, let me ask you a question. When I did my net present value in IRR, I used expected cash flows. Keyword is expected. To get those expected cash flows, I projected revenues, expenses, taxes, um, maintenance, capex to come to the cash flows. So let me. Uh, the question I have is a very simple and an easy one. Could it be? Is it possible that I've screwed up on my estimates? Could my revenues be overestimated? My costs be higher than expected? My tax rate could go up. You know, in fact, every single number I've used in my analysis is an estimate, right? I could be wrong on that. And this is always going to be the case whenever you do investment analysis or valuation. You're going to be done and you're going to look at the numbers and say, hey, what if I'm wrong? So I have a question for you. And this question cuts to the heart of how you're dealing with this crisis and everything that's going on around you. How, do, how would you respond to this uncertainty? And let me give you some choices. You could wait for the uncertainty to be resolved. If you do that, what's going to happen? You're going to wait forever, right? Because one uncertainty after the, there, there's no way uncertainty is ever going to go away. Maybe you will not take an investment if there's uncertainty. Can you imagine doing that? If you don't take an investment, if there's uncertainty, you will never take an investment. You're going to be paralyzed. You can ask a colleague, a consultant to do it, in which case you're just displacing the uncertainty, asking somebody else to deal with it. You can ignore it, which is really tough to do. Or maybe there's something else we can do. So what I'd like to talk about is how to deal with uncertainty. And this is really not nothing to do with your case. This has got to do with everything we do, not just in finance, but in life. If you have uncertainty, what are some of the healthier ways of dealing with it? One of the simplest ways of dealing with uncertainty, one of the oldest ways of dealing with uncertainty investment analysis is to compute what's called a payback. Let me explain what a payback is. The payback is basically the number of years it takes you to get the investment you've made back. So as an example, if you take Disney in the Disney theme park and you look at their cash flows, they're investing almost four and a half billion dollars in this new theme park, right? Now, I know you'd like this theme park to be a good investment and make a lot of money on the four and a half billion. But at the minimum, wouldn't you like to get the four and a half billion back? That's what payback computes. It computes how many years it takes you to get your initial investment back. So all I do is I keep adding the cash flows until I get to accumulated cash flow greater than zero. And it happens around 10 point, 10, between 10 and 11 years. So if you ask me, how many years does it take me to get my money back? I'd say about 10 to 11 years. So you say, what am I going to do with this? There are many companies that actually adopt what are called payback constraints, which means they will not take a project if it takes more than five, eight or 10 years to get the money back. You're saying, how do they come up with the five, eight or 10? Well, it's almost arbitrary. They do it based on their comfort levels, but it's their way of dealing with uncertainty, which is if the technology could change, the world could change, I need to make my money back as soon as I can. But think about it. Even if you make your four and a half billion back in 10.3 years, you're not made whole again because that four and a half billion could have been invested elsewhere and made a return. So a more stringent version of payback, here's what you do. You discount the cash flow. See the third column, the fourth column, the present value of the cash flows. And then you add that accumulated present value to see when that number turned positive. And that number turns positive between 16 and 17 years, almost 17 years. That's called discounted payback. In both cases, you're looking at how many years it takes you to get your money back. So before I can move on to the next way of dealing with uncertainty, any questions about it? So it's a very simple approach. It's been around for as long as people have been taking investments. And the question we're asking is, how quickly can I make my upfront investment bag and get to zero before I start to get ambitious? Um, between discounted payback and normal payback, which one would you choose and why? I wouldn't use either. I mean, this, it's in, in a sense, it's, it, they're both very simplistic measures. I'll tell you the kinds of places people use them. They use them where technology is shifting and you want to make your money back. Payback is probably just, I want my, I would say most people use just payback because the reality is when people adopt these simple measures, they don't want to deal with discount rates and discounting. Discounted payback is something that you see talked about, but very few companies actually use. Okay, so let's talk about other ways of dealing with uncertainty. Yeah. I, 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 when you finish doing an analysis, it's almost it's al almost always the case that somebody in a group, if you're doing a group analysis, what if this number changes? What if revenues are higher? What if costs go up? 
and you can ask what if questions. And I'll be quite honest, it's become much too easy to ask what if questions in analysis. Sounds like a weird thing to say, but I'll give you a little bit of history. I, uh, I did my MBA eons ago, ancient times, 1979 through 81. And uh, in 1980, which was the, at the end of the first year of my MBA, I had to go looking for a summer internship. And 1980 was in the depths of one of the worst recessions in the last 50 years. There were no jobs to be found. I finally, uh, finally found a, a job at a place called Watermark. It was this small company that produced radio shows to syndicate. In fact, it had only one big radio show, a huge success called American Top 40. You know, the host was a guy called Casey Kasem and the way it worked was they, it was a very incredible concept where they took the top 40 songs of the week and they started with song 40 and then but it's still around actually. I think Casey Kasem is dead and gone, but there's somebody else now who, who and if you drive across the US on a Sunday, you can hear American Top 40. So this was 1980, they had this one show and the way the show worked was they made the show in the small studio in, um, in Culver City in, in Los Angeles, or Studio City in Los Angeles, and then they sold the show to hundreds of radio stations. So they charged $1,000 to each radio station. They sold it to 420, per week. They sold it to 425, 425 stations, and 425 times 1,000 is $425,000 a week. So it was a pretty good cash cut. But they were ambitious. They wanted to grow. So they wanted to add a second show called Soundtrack of the 60s. They found a DJ to run the show called Murray the Kid, very famous disc jockey of the 1980s. So they wanted somebody to analyze the show to tell them whether they should take the show. Here I am, green behind the ear. I mean, basically, I've taken one corporate finance class and they hire me to analyze the show. So I still remember I walk into this small office. It was a small company. There were like 15 people working. There was a guy who was called the CFO, but he had a cubicle. I had a mini cubicle. I went up to him. And I said, well, I've been hired to analyze the show. Can you give me the cash flows of the show? Because in every one of my classes, projects came with cash flows. He handed me a blank ledger book. If you've never seen a ledger book, it's basically a book with columns drawn through it, nothing on it. And he said, well, that's all we have is a ledger sheet. And I said, there is nothing here. And I said, that's, he says, that's why we hired you, is you have to fill this ledger sheet with all the items you need to come to the cash flows. So I said, how difficult can it be? So I said, okay, it's a show. So basically I need to know how many stations they can sell the show to and how much they would charge. And so he said, go talk to the marketing guy. Another guy in a, in a cubicle, three cubicles over. I go to the marketing guy and he hated me at first sight. Why? Because I was a numbers guy and he was a creative guy and he didn't like any numbers guys. So I stood outside his cubicle for three days. He acted like I didn't exist until finally I decided I had to ask him the question. Otherwise, I'd never get started. I said, look, I need to get started. Can you tell me how many stations you can sell the soundtrack of the 60s to? He said, I don't know, 100, 200, 300, something like that. And then he walks away. And I knew that this was all I was going to get from him. So in my base case analysis, guess how many stations I used? 100, 200, 300. I went right down the middle. I used 200 stations. I estimated $1,000 per station because that's what they were charging for the existing show. And I got $200,000 as revenues each week. And basically I got the revenue line item. And line item by line item, I had to go through asking people and making judgments and building up. It wasn't a spreadsheet, it was basically a ledger sheet. Six weeks later, I had cash flows and I had a net present value for the show. I was so proud of myself. I converted a blank ledger paper into a net present value. The net present value was negative. So I went to the CEO of the company. He, had, he was the only guy who actually had his own office. And I said, look, I've done the analysis on the show. I'm, I'm ready to present. And he said, let me call together the board of directors, which was three of his buddies. And we sat around a coffee table and I presented my numbers. And I come to the, the climactic moment. I said, based on my analysis, the show looks like it has negative net present value. You should not take the show. They look at each other and they say, well, what would happen if you use 300 stations? My stomach drops. Because remember, this isn't an Excel spreadsheet where you change 200 to 300. If I change 200 to 300 on a ledger paper, you know what I needed to do? I need to go through every single number by hand in a calculator and change it. I said, well, you know, if I change it to 300, the net present value would turn positive. And they said, why don't you change it to 300? And they said, why? 
They said, we've already decided to take the show. We just want you to confirm it. And at that time, I thought it was just because we're a small, unsophisticated company. And I said, this doesn't make sense. They're making the decision first and doing the analysis afterwards. After 40 years of dealing with CFOs at some of the largest companies around the world and looking how, at how decisions are made at companies, I think this is more the rule than the exception. In most companies, decisions get made first, the analysis follows. The numbers, the number crunching follows the, the, somebody saying, we want to take the project. And the bigger the project, the less the analysis seems to matter completely. It makes no sense, right? So you're doing a $10 billion acquisition. Somebody decides, hey, let's do the numbers to back it up. But my bigger point about this analysis is in 1980, asking a what if question and answering it took so much time that you asked relatively few questions. Today, it's easy to do, right? You do an Excel spreadsheet. So what if this is, what if, what if you know, take Netflix, you can ask what if the number of subscribers goes up 20%, goes down 30, 20%. Doing the word of analysis has become way too easy. And what I mean by way too easy is people are getting carried away and they're losing sight of the end game. And I'll tell you a very little story to illustrate this. Now, I've done this case every year for the last 20 years and um, the case each year obviously is different. So this was about you know, three years ago. I, you know, I, I don't even remember what the case was. I put out the case and I said, and I'm going to put out the same request to you as well, is do the analysis, keep your eyes on the price, your end game is to tell me whether to take this investment or not. Tell me whatever you need to tell me, but please keep your analysis short because I want to read all your analysis. So I said, keep it to five, six, maybe seven pages overall. You can have a few exhibits, but don't get carried away. So most people, I think there were 87 groups in that class, and uh, no, most, most of the groups listen to my advice and the projects come back seven, eight, nine pages. And there was this one project which had 110 pages. These were the days when I used to ask for physical reports. I no longer do this. Everybody now turns in PDF reports, so the physical report. I pick up the report, so what the heck did these people do? They'd run 105 different scenarios on the project. Scenarios like what if Ben Bernanke catches a cold? Ben Bernanke was then the Federal Reserve Chair, what if, or Janet Yellen catches a cold. It, it was basically, they, they must have run, written a macro to just run scenarios. And here's the problem they face. At the end of the 105 scenarios, in 55 of the scenarios, the net present value was positive. In 50 of the scenarios, the net present value was negative. So here was the final concluding page. And, and I'm not kidding. They said, if you know you're going to be in a positive scenario, take the project. If you think you're going to be in a negative scenario, don't take the project. We're too confused. You make the decision. They were at least being honest because this is exactly what often happens when you start asking what if and what if questions and doing sensitivity analysis is you forget why you started doing it in the first place. You end up getting less clarity rather than more clarity, less certain about your decision rather than more certain. And that's not what, how it's supposed to work. So a couple of pieces of advice if you ask what if questions about any kind of analysis, it could be evaluation, it could be a project, it could be any kind of analysis where there's uncertainty. Less is more. If you're going to ask what if questions, keep it focused on the one or two or maybe three variables that, that you really think matter. I call these driver variables. When I value companies, I try to isolate the two or three variables that I think drive value and ask what if questions only about those three. Try not to ask what if questions about macro variables that are out of your control. So that's the first piece of advice. The second is if you can take your what if analysis and instead of turning out a hundred tables, create a picture that summarizes what you found. It's much more effective than making people go through a hundred tables. I'll be quite honest. When I get a report with 20 tables, I don't go through 20 tables. Why? Because I'm going to drown in the numbers. See if there's a visual way of presenting your what if analysis. And I'm going to show you one of my favorite pictures of all time that does what if uh, that, that presents a story. This is from a book called The Visual Display of Information. It's one of my favorite books. It's, to, it's a paperback now. You can get it for $10. I'd strongly advise you get it. It's a fun book to read. It's not a finance book. It's written by a guy called Tufte, T-U-F-T-E, Edward Tufte. I'll send the actual reference after the class. And basically what he, what he looks at is pictures through time of how people took a story and showed it as a picture. And in that book is one of my favorite pictures of all time. 
It's a picture that basically captures what happened when Napoleon in the 1800s decided that he was going to invade Russia. So here it is, early 1800s, Napoleon wakes up one day. He's emperor of everything he serves. He can do whatever he wants. And he says, look, I'd like to invade Russia. Don't ask me why. So I guess Russia is big. The European countries like to invade it. So, you know, Napoleon decides to invade Russia. So he gathers this huge army. See this brown line? The, the breadth of that line is the size of the French army leaving Paris. In all pomp and splendor, they leave Paris and they start marching through Europe. You say, what are these little tangents off? They get distracted and you, know, you get to Poland. You say, there's a country we can invade there. So these, these are distractions, countries they invade along the way. They keep marching and marching and marching and Russia is a long ways off. So they get to the outskirts of Russia. They keep going and going and they realize it's getting colder and colder and colder. Notice the army is getting smaller and smaller. And then they get to the outskirts of Moscow. And it's around December 15th. Have you ever been in Moscow, December? Don't go there. It's really cold. It's exactly the reaction Napoleon and his army had. And in fact, there's still a gate in Moscow when Napoleon's army stopped. They say it's too cold. We're going to go back. See this black column? That's in the French army going back from Moscow. And notice what's happening to the army as, as they go through. And if you look at the other graph, there's the temperature dropping as they go back. No. So as the temperature is dropping, the army is getting smaller. Half the army, I think, abandons and runs away. And you get back to Paris. It's three people carrying Napoleon home. This is an amazing picture. It tells a whole story in one picture. All you have to do is show me what will happen to your project if your profit margins change. Think of a creative way of doing it. And it's not insert sheet or insert chart in Excel that does it for you. Think through how you want to present your results because this, I mean, we are drowning in, we live in a world where we drown in numbers. Think of a way where you can be creative about presenting your what if analysis. So if my advice with what if is do it, but keep it, you know, keep it focused on two or three variables and find a creative way of showing me what you found. So it's, this is not, not about the case. So don't even think about the case. This is in general. Find creative ways of showing what you found on your what if analysis. Again, I'm going to pause and allow for questions before I go to the third way of dealing with uncertainty. So payback is the first, what if analysis is the second. Any questions on what if analysis? Go ahead. No? Okay. Okay, so let's go to the third way. And this is a way that I, you know, 40 years ago would have been not feasible for most of us. It's called a Monte Carlo simulation. Monte Carlo simulation, here's what you do. Remember when I showed you the numbers for Disney, I gave you revenues and I told you expenses are going to be 60% of revenues in the theme parks and I gave you a country risk premium for Brazil. Those were all numbers I felt comfortable with at the time that I gave them, given what I knew about the theme park. But I'm not certain about these numbers. These numbers could be off. My revenues could be higher or lower than expected because this is a real theme park, not in Orlando, not in Paris, not in Tokyo. My expenses in Rio might be higher or lower than the 60% and my country risk in Brazil could go up or down. Brazil is a volatile country. So here's what I did. Instead of using my point estimates, I put in distribution for each of these numbers. Let me explain what I mean. I said, for revenues, I said, I might, I, here are my base case revenues. That's what you saw in my original analysis. But my actual revenues could be 20% higher or 20% lower. And I'm uncertain where it'll fall. I'm going to assume there's a uniform probability that it'll fall anywhere between 20% below or 20% up. This is called a uniform distribution. And basically it says my revenues could be anywhere from 20% below expectations to 20% above expectations. That was my first distribution. For operating expenses, I said my base case is 60%. But you know what? My expenses in Rio could be much higher than, than expected because who knows what the cost would be. Maybe I need more security in Rio, in which case my expenses might be 75%. Or maybe my cost can be much lower. Maybe my personal, uh, the cost of hiring people is much lower. And maybe it could be as low as 45%. Notice that my base case assumption is 60%, but my distribution captures my uncertainty. This is called a triangular distribution. And finally, for the country risk premium, if you remember, 
I used a 3% country risk premium for Brazil, but that could become much higher or much lower. In this case, I've assumed a normal distribution for it to capture the fact that I'm uncertain about these. So the, when you're doing Monte Carlo simulations, first you pick the variables. In this case, I've picked the three variables I'm most uncertain about. Second, you pick distributions that capture those variables. And those distributions, if you remember statistics, can range from symmetric distributions, and I picked all symmetric, to asymmetric distributions. And if it sounds foreign language to you, don't worry, it's not a big deal. So asymmetric distributions, your positive outcomes, your negative outcomes are more common. And then you have to pick a center for the distribution. So I've got the distributions. Here's what you do in a Monte Carlo simulation. You go in and pick one outcome out of each distribution. You want to try? Let's go pick an outcome out of the revenue distribution. Well, my initial, let's say the first outcome I pick, my revenues are 93% of what I expected them to be. So I'm going to have lower revenues. I go pick an outcome out of the cost distribution. Let's say I get unlucky and I pick 65%. Why unlucky? My costs are now higher than expected. So my revenues are lower than expected, my costs are higher than expected, and let's say I pick a country risk premium of 4.3%, higher than, than I initially anticipated. I have lower revenues, higher costs, a higher cost of capital, but guess what I'm going to get as a net present value? A much lower number, perhaps even negative. I do it again, and again, and again. And each time I do this, I get a different present, net present value. When I'm done, I end up with a net present value distribution. Now, uh, Abhishek asked the question, is there a reason why I pick a particular distribution for a particular expense? Yes. And the way you come up with the distributions is you either look at past data. So for instance, if you have seven theme parks that Disney has, the operating expenses are not 60% at all of them, right? In some they're 66, there's some they're 54. So one is you can look at existing investments you have. And if you're somebody like Home Depot with 250 stores, you're going to have a distribution you have on that expense item. The second is you look at your history of making judgments on estimates. So you look at how close you were on your Tokyo Disney or Euro Disney. So you either look at cross-sectional data that you already have or your own history making the judgment. The actual distribution choice reflects what that variable, what, what values that variable can take on. For instance, your operating expenses cannot be less than 0%, right? So basically, it can, you can't use a normal distribution for operating expenses because you have, a, you, you have a floor on the distribution. So you have to look at the variable to make the judgment, but it's, that's, part, that's the biggest part of learning to do Monte Carlo simulations is picking up your statistics book and getting a sense of what the distributions are and then learning to work with the data. So what am I going to get out of this net present value distribution? If you look at the across the distributions, the net present value that I get, the median net present value that I have across, I think I ran 10,000 uh, simulations. You know, the median value that I got was about 3.3 billion, which is very close to what I got with my base case. You're saying I did all of that work to come up with the same answer. But in addition to the median, look at what else I find. I have my best case scenario here, so I don't have to do best case, worst case, it's there. My best case is I could, net present value could be nine billion. Worst case, it could be negative. In fact, my net present value is negative 12% of the time. Now here's how you can bring this into decision analysis. If you are a decision maker now, not only have I told you this project is a good project, I've told you best case, worst case, 90th percentile, 10th percentile, in fact, whenever I do, simulations, I look at the, 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 the 75th percentile, the median, just to get a sense of what is the chance I'm wrong on this analysis. So it gives you more information, it gives you a richer way of looking at projects. And as I said, 40 years ago, we, it will cost you a million and a half, two million dollars to do something like this, because you didn't need access to a mainframe computer and somebody who knew how to program the computer. Today, it's effortless. It's effortless, it'll cost you a couple of hundred dollars. Here's what you need to do. You, in fact, it'll cost you nothing because Stern already has this program that you can download from their apps. It's called Crystal Ball. You download the app and you, it's an add-on to Excel. So basically what it does, it creates an extra menu item in Excel. It's magical because here's what it allows you to do. It allows you to take a cell where you used to enter a number and instead of entering a number, you can now enter a distribution in Excel. In fact, it can take an existing Excel spreadsheet you have where you have a value of a project or a value of a company and convert it to a Monte Carlo simulation. 
The only cautionary note I would have is don't enter garbage because you look, you get garbage in, garbage out. So you just go enter random distributions. You're going to get a great looking piece of output, but mean absolutely nothing. You can also, I mean, Ben says you can do it for free in R, but you know, uh, uh, R requires, uh, the advantage of crystal ball is the learning curve is very, very, very low. And uh, Ryan mentioned there's a class that covers it. I know uh, about decision making under, under uncertainty. It's in fact, you don't need to even take a class. Just download it and start experimenting with it. It's an amazing program to add on to Excel. So any other questions on Monte Carlo simulations? Again, I'm not pushing you to do this on Netflix, on the Netflix fit. You are, actually don't have the data to do it. So the only thing you're going to be doing is putting in random distributions. But in general, have this tool in your toolkit. It's a very useful tool. Now, when I do valuations of company, I almost always do it as a simulation as well, because I find for my decisions, because that's the only reason I value companies, the, the distribution of values is more useful than just knowing what a single value is. And when we live in a period like this one, and you have to make decisions in a world where uncertainty is just multiplied tenfold, having a tool like this might allow you to make decisions where otherwise you'd be paralyzed. Okay, so no questions? Okay, so let's keep moving. So now let's assume that you are the decision maker. Remember when I started this theme park, I said you are the, you are the person who's going to pull the trigger on this project, decide whether to take the project or not. Let's say you are that person. And I come to you with what I found. I said, look, the net present value is about 3.3 billion, but there's about a 10% or a 12% chance your net present value could be negative. How would you use the information that I've now given you? Because originally I just said net present value is 3.3 billion, take it or leave it. Now I've said there's a 10% chance the net present value could be negative. How would you use this information? And I'll give you the choices. You'd still accept the investment, print off the results from the Monte Carlo simulation, put it in a folder. And this way, when the, if the project turns bad, you can pull the folder out and say, look, I did my homework, it's, don't blame me. You know? Maybe you are risk averse and say, I'm going to reject an investment because it's too risky. There's a 10% chance it's a bad project. Or is there something else? My, gen my question in general is when you do what if analyses or simulations, what exactly do you use that information for? In, in, you know, how exactly as a decision maker would you use that information? Anybody? Well, no, this is already an expected value. The property weights will give you exactly that expected value. So remember that 3.3 billion in the previous page? That is already, so you don't even need to do a property to get an expected value. If you do scenarios, you might need to, but then your scenarios have to be complete. So if you do a Monte Carlo simulation, the expected value is already there. And it's going to give you exactly the same number that you got in your base case because you're, you're building off the same distributions. Okay, so let me, let me give it my shot. I would actually be very careful about rejecting projects which have positive net present values just because the what if told me that there's a 15% chance of failure. And here's what, I think I'm double counting risk. Let me explain. When I computed my original net present value, remember in the base case, what did I do? I projected out expected cash flows, then I discounted those cash flows at what rate? A risk adjusted rate. That net present value is already risk adjusted. And if I now proceed to reject that project because there's a 15% chance it'll turn negative, I am double counting, okay? So I'd be very cautious about rejecting projects, but here's how I'd use the what if analysis. Let me go back to the previous page. My worst case scenario here is that I could lose a billion dollars. Can Disney afford to lose a billion dollars? Yeah, they're a big company, they have a lot of cash flows. But let's say my worst case scenario here was I could lose 15 billion and I'm a small company. You see why I might hold back? I could say, look, this project is a good project, but if I take this project and terrible things happen, it could take me down with it. Survival might make you decide, of not wanting to fail might make you decide not to take the project. So one way to deal with this, bring in this analysis to look to see if you have constraints that might be violated if bad things happen on this project. That's one way. The second is, is there something I can do about reducing the tails on this distribution? 
Anybody in a, so there are tails in this distribution, right? Obviously the tail I worry about is big negative tails. Is there something I can do upfront before I take the project that reduce those tails? Insurance. Insurance, hedging. You could actually argue that one, and I'm gonna come back and talk about this more explicitly, that insurance, hedging, is one way in which you can reduce the tails. Maybe you can, but one of the ways your, your net present value could turn negative is if the Brazilian RIA started doing some crazy stuff and started depreciating like crazy. So maybe by buying forwards and futures, you could reduce the tails. The second is more operational. Maybe one of the reasons these tails are so negative is your expected labor costs could jump around because people might demand more wages Maybe you can enter into long-term contracts with your unions that keep those costs more predictable. So both operating and financial decisions might allow you to bring in or bring the tails in. So I would use this analysis not just to decide whether to take the project, but how to manage it. Emily also asked the question, should I consider opportunity costs? All costs should be factored in. So this is the final net present value with all side costs and side benefits already factored in. We'll talk explicitly about how to bring those side costs and side benefits, but the net present value you're working with should be your final net present value. Okay? Harrison asks, how about delaying investment? Harrison, that's the road to doing nothing. If you delay investment to get more, what information are you gonna to get to reduce risk? Is Brazil going to get safer over the next 20 years? So delaying investment for more information makes sense only if there's explicit information you're looking for. If there's no explicit information, I would say just make the decisions, the information you have, because otherwise you end up putting things off forever. Yona asks a good question. What about doing a pilot? If this were the first theme park I were ever opening, then I might suggest doing it on a small scale first before you do it. That's what a pilot or a test market does. But given this is the sixth or the seventh theme park, they already have well-established investments. But these are all good pieces of advice. And I'm glad you're thinking about creative things to do. And that's what what if analyses and Monte Carlo simulation should lead to is, is, is creative discussion. What can we do to make the project better? What can we do make to make our decision better? Rather than, hey, what can we do to cover our rear rents? Which is unfortunately what a lot of what if analysis seems to become. So if there are no questions, I want to move on to a second project. Are there any final questions about the Disney theme park? No. Shane asks, well, you know, on double counting risk, why do Monte Carlo at all if your net present value is at risk adjust? You don't do, don't do Monte Carlo to get a better net present value. You do a Monte Carlo to get the rest of the information, right? You wouldn't have got the tails in the distribution. The, the 10th or the 25th percentile, you wouldn't have got all the information about how to manage the project better if you hadn't done the simulation. So it's not that I'm going to make a better decision per se, but I'm going to manage my project better with a Monte Carlo simulation behind me than with one net present value. Okay. Is, uh, David asks, is there analysis that shows the key drivers of the NPV? Yes, there is. In fact, change each variable, see which variables cause the biggest shift in the NPV. Those often are your key drivers, right? So if you take revenues, let's say you take working capital and you change it and nothing happens in net present value. Set it to the side. You change to and Alexander asks, can you change your cost of capital to reflect those worst case scenarios? Don't even go there. No. Because if you do that, then you're going to triple count, multiple count, you know, you won't be they, then you'll be triple counting risk. Because if you make your cost of capital high enough to reflect your worst case scenarios, and then you do a scenario analysis on top of that, God help you. So I, I would say an internal rate of return is if in effect what you're you know, a what if on your cost of capital. So don't change your cost of capital. So if there are no further questions, let's move on to the second project. My second project, I'm going to look at a new iron ore mine that Vale is planning to open in Canada. And in this analysis, I'm going to do everything in equity terms. If you, if you find that to be a mysterious statement, I'll explain what I mean by this. I'm going to look at everything through the eyes of equity investors. So when I do my accounting returns, Rather than compute the return on the total invested capital, I'm going to look at return in equity, where I'm looking at net income, which is what I get as an equity investor, and dividing by book equity. When I do my cash flows, I'm going to look at cash flows after interest payments. Remember when I did my cash flows for Disney, I looked at operating income and cash flows before debt payments. 
we are going to look at cash flows after interest payments, after principal payments, so called cash flows equity. I'm going to discount those cash flows back at the cost of equity, and then I'm going to compare that to what equity investment I had to make in the project. If you're completely mystified, hang in there because the example might make it clearer. So here's what my project looks like. The mine will require an initial investment of 1.25 billion, and it's designed to produce about 8 million tons of iron ore. A billion dollars of this 1.25 billion is going to get depreciated over the next 10 years using an accelerated depreciation method called double declining balance. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. It means I get more depreciation up front, less later. The mine will start production midway through the first year and produce 4 million tons and then the production each year will increase you know, to 6 million in year two. So it's going to stagger into full production. The, the price of uh, per ton of, uh, of iron ore is, going, is $100, and I'm going to assume it's going to stay the same in real terms, basically the rise of the inflation rate over the, over the life of the plant. The variable cost is going to be $45, and there's a fixed cost of $125 million. Both those costs are also going to grow at the inflation rate. The costs are in Canadian dollars, and I'm going to convert those Canadian dollars into U.S. dollars assuming that the current parity will hold because interest and inflation interest rates and inflation rates in the two currencies are roughly the same that's the only scenario we can assume exchange rates continue to hold working capital will be 20 percent of revenues and the investments will be made at the beginning of each year the key that, that matters is when i put the working capital investment is determined by whether i invest my working capital at the start of the year or the end of the year at the end of the 10th year i'm going to assume that the working capital is going to be salvaged and the project is going to be ended. So unlike the Disney theme park where the project keeps going after year 10, here at the end of year 10, the mine is done, I, I shut it down, and I salvage my working capital. Vale's tax rate of 34% is going to apply to this project. So let me review again. Vale is planning uh, or is, is thinking about investing in this iron ore mine. It's going to cost 1.25 billion. A billion of that is going to be depreciable. But at the end of the 10th year, you're going to be able to salvage the remaining 250 million. The mine will start production, stagger into production by the, at the end of year three are in full production. The variable costs and fixed costs are given and they will grow with inflation rate and working capital is 20% of revenues. Now I'm gonna add a, a, a variable to this. This particular investment is going to be funded with about a half a billion dollars at debt, of debt. Well, the interest rate on the debt is set at 4.05% in US dollar, in, in dollar terms. So everything is done in US dollars. They're going to use a 10-year term loan. You know what a term loan is? You pay the loan off in equal annual installments. So every year, the actual payment is going to be 61.8 million. This is how mortgages get paid off as well. So term loans are pretty common in practice. But the, but the loan itself each year, if you look at the breakdown, even though the payment is the same, each year the amount that's interest in ex and principal remains different. The way you compute how much is interest in principal is you take the starting debt, 500 million, times 4.05%, that gives me the interest in year one, 20.25 million. You subtract that from the 61.80, I repay 41.55 million. You subtract the 41.55 from the 500, there's my ending debt. So every year, I keep track of my beginning and ending debt. I keep track of how much of the payments are interest in principle. You think, why should I care? Okay. So the, the question was about how I get the interest in principle. Each year I compute the interest expense by taking the beginning debt and multiplying by 4.05%. I get the beginning debt by taking the, the, the debt at the start of each year and subtracting out how much I repay. So the whole table has to be done in sick. You got to go line item by line item and essentially compute the debt due each year, the interest and principal repay. Now you might wonder, why do I care how much of the payment is interest and how much is principal? Here's why. Interest is tax deductible, principal is not. So it's going to affect my cash flows and that's why I break it down. So half a billion of this project is going to be funded with debt. I've told you the payments and how much of the payments are interest and principal. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to compute my hurdle rate for this project because remember I need a discount rate for the cash flows. And first, I'm going to do my hurdle rate in, in US dollars. Why? Because my cash flows are in US dollars. That's a consistency rule we set up front. You tell me what currency your cash flows are in, and because my cash flows are going to be in US dollars, my hurdle rate is going to be a US dollar cost of equity. 
I'm also going to use the cost of equity. Why? Because my plan is to compute cash flows to equity. So if you remember this table from way back, I don't think you do, but if you do, there's a cost of equity of 11.13% that I computed for the iron ore portion of Vale. That is now going to become my discount rate for the cash flows to equity. So I've got my ducks all lined up. Let me do my cash flows. There's a lot on this page, so I'm gonna go line item by line item. The first line is my production. Notice it gets staggered in, 4 million, 6 million, 8 million, and after year three, it's at 8 million. That's full capacity. My price per ton of, of, per ton of ore, um, iron ore is $100 right now, growing at the inflation rate, 2%, so 102, 104.04, so it's 100 growing at 2%. My revenues are my production times my price, four times 102, 408 million. My variable costs are 45% of my revenues. My fixed cost is 125 million. My depreciation is 200 million, which is just the original investment double. So that's a double decline. Notice that I'm depreciating a billion, but I get more depreciation up front, less later. My EBIT in year one is a loss. I'm losing money, but it's a money-making company. So I, you know, so I, I'm, I'm still going to be able to claim the tax benefit, but unlike Disney, where I stopped at EBIT, I now subtract out the interest expenses. Remember from the table before, 20.25, I have a taxable income to equity investors of minus 117.25. As with Disney, I'm gonna assume I'll get the tax benefit right away. So that's a 34% tax benefit. I get a net loss in year one. I do this every year, year two. And remember, everything grows at the inflation rate. So basically my price per ton grows at the inflation rate, my cost grows at the inflation rate, so I get my net income and my net, my net income starts to turn positive in year two and it climbs over time. Now in terms of my book value, I do exactly, do exactly what I did with Disney in terms of, I start with my beginning, beginning investment, 1.25 billion. I subtract our depreciation. But unlike Disney, notice I don't have any capital maintenance expenditures. After year one, I'm not investing anymore. Why? Because I plan to shut this mine down after year 10. So there's my ending book value, and I subtract out debt outstanding. Now, this again, I did not do for Disney. Why did I not do it for Disney? Because I was looking at total capital here because I'm interested in my book equity. I subtract out the remaining principal outstanding. So now you see why I did that debt table first, because without it, I could not have done either the net income or the book value of equity. So I have net income every year and the book value of equity every year. So you know what my first stop is going to be? When I did my Disney analysis, the first thing I computed was an accounting return, right? I can now compute an accounting return to equity investors. And here's what I'm going to do to compute the accounting return. I'm going to take the net income, income to equity investors, and divide by book value of equity. So my, you know, so basically I bought the book value equity at the start of the year and the average for the year. So the difference between this table and the Disney table, and I would compare the two if you get a chance, is here I'm looking at net income instead of after-tax operating income, and here I'm looking at book equity rather than book value of total capital. I divide net income by book value of equity. I come up with a return in equity. Take a look at that last column. Notice how it climbs over time. With any finite life project, you know what I mean by a finite life project? A project that's gonna end after a period your return on equity will tend to climb over time because you have fewer and fewer assets left by the time you get to year seven or eight or nine or 10. It's a, it's a flaw in the process because it means older projects always look great because you've depreciated their assets down close to zero. This is true for companies as well. Older companies sometimes look great simply because your assets get depreciated down to a very low value. My US dollar return on equity for this project is 31.36%. If you remember, the cost of equity in US dollars for an iron ore project is 11.13%. So 31.36% is higher than 11.13%. Alex is asking whether the income gets paid in dividends. Why, does, why, do, why do we need dividends? We're not even talking about cash flows yet. This is just net income. The return on equity is not based on dividends. It's based on net income. And when you do cash flows, you're actually computing what could be paid in dividends. So hold off on the question of what the cash flow is. Return on equity is always net income based. Dividends don't even enter the picture. Okay? Any questions? So return on equity and return on capital. I want at least, I know there are a lot of moving parts, 
I want people to get at least a conceptual sense of what's different about them. In return on capital, I'm looking at the accounting return on the total amount invested in the project. In return equity, I'm looking at the return on just the equity portion of the project. When I do return capital, I compare to the cost of capital. When I do return equity, I compare it to the cost of equity. Rukshan asks, do I use book equity because we don't have a market value? No, we're using book equity because we want to use book equity. Remember when we did return and invested capital? We did book value as well. If I mark up to market, it's not going to tell me whether the project is a good project or, or a bad project. I want to use book equity. In fact, that's it's not because I don't have market equity. I don't want to use market equity. I have to use book value. Uh, any other questions? Let's now talk about doing this for an entire firm. Remember how we computed return on capital for a firm? And in fact, we started with the question of what do we do when book equity becomes, book capital becomes, book equity or book capital becomes a really low number? We can do this entire analysis for a firm as well, right? We can do the return equity by taking the total net income and the total book equity and subtracting our cost of equity. That spread is very much like the spread we got by looking at overall capital. You're saying, why would I need to do both? I think sometimes they can give you more information. And in some cases, especially with banks and financial service firms, this is the only measure of return you can compute. Why? Because with banks, debt is not a source of capital. It's raw material. So you can't even compute a return on capital or cost of capital for a bank. But you can compute return on equity and cost of equity. For non-financial service firms, I often do both. I do return on capital minus cost of capital and return on equity minus cost of equity. And sometimes, and we'll talk more about this as we go through this class, if the two give you divergent answers, where one says the projects are good and the other says the projects are bad, you will have to ask, which one do I go with? And I would go with the capital measure more than the equity measure because the equity measures tend to be much more volatile. Okay? So that's the advantage of doing both. So now let's do what we did with this, is once we got the earnings, we had to go to cash flows, right? So I'm gonna do that for this project. And the process of going from earnings to cash flows is again very similar to what I did with the Disney theme park. I added back depreciation and amortization. Remember why we do that. It's an accounting expense, but it's not a cash expense. I subtract out capital expenditures. Why? Because they're cash outflows, just because I don't have, you know, the, uh, the accountant says it's not an expense. It doesn't mean I don't have to spend it. Here there's only an initial amount and then you're done. And then I subtract out change in working capital. And remember, because it happens at the start of every year, my first investment in working capital happens right now. Zero is actually not a year. It's a point in time. It's right now. So think of it as what do I have to spend right now? There's my working capital investment. There's my cash flow equity. One thing you will notice is my investment in year zero is only 750 million. You say, but it was 1.25 billion. What happened? Remember half a billion of that came from debt. And since I'm focusing just on my cash flows as equity investors, I have to think only about the 750 million that I have to, that I have to come up with. Now, one of the things that I do here that I did not do in my Disney cash flows is I do subtract out debt, the principal repayments in debt. Why? Because they're debt outflows. So these are cash outflows to me as an equity investor. So what I'm left with as my bottom line is my cash flow to equity. So if you compare this again to the cash flow to the firm, cash flow to the firm, I'm computing cash flows before interest and principal payments. Here I'm computing cash flows after interest and principal payments. Cash flows to the firm, I look at the total investment in the project. Cash flows to equity, I look at only the equity portion of my investment. I discount those cash flows to equity at my cost of equity. So again, I'm staying internally consistent. What I get as my net present value is 304 million. Okay. If there was a remaining debt balance at the end of year 10, you have to you have to subtract it from your 10th year's cash flow. So in fact, if this had been what it's called a balloon payment loan, where you pay only interest every year, when you do your final cash flow, you'll have to subtract out the five, 500 million that you borrowed as a cash outflow. So make sure you tie up your loose sets when you do cash flow equity and you do have to add the salvage value and the working capital at the end of the 10th year because it's a finite life project. Don't do this if you expect to continue the project forever because you can't have your cake and eat it too. You know what I mean by that? You can't sell your assets and keep the project going. Yeah. But basically it's a finite life project and I'm going to add the salvage value back at the end of year 10 
And I, I would always do that. Don't do anything separately because it's not worth the kind of comp the complexity that it creates. So any questions about the difference between what we did here and what we did for Disney? Because again, I'm doing the same thing, but I'm doing it entirely through the equity investor's perspective. The question that, that, I'm sorry, this is going to be disgusting, but turn away if you find it. I have to blow my nose. I, my allergies are kicking in. Shashank asked, asked a question. If I do a Monte Carlo simulation, what kind of distribution do I use? Uh, you know what? I'll send you a, a, a small packet I have on picking the right distribution for variable. It's, it's too messy for me to go in in the context of this particular class right now in this session. But I would send that out today as well. So I'm making a lot of promise of what I'll send out. So I'm keeping tabs on it. So if you don't get it, let me know. Any other questions about the equity analysis? Okay. So now let, let's do the what if on this particular project. The first thing I did was a computer in IRR, doing exactly what I did for the theme park, changing the discount rate, looking to see whether the net present value is zero. And guess what? The IRR for this project is about 28%, which is well above my cost of equity again. So it confirms what my net present value said. And remember, most of the time that's going to be the case. I'm now going to ask a, a word of question about this analysis, just like I did for the Disney analysis. I did this entire analysis in US dollars, right? I did dollar cash flows, a dollar cost of equity, and I did a dollar net present value. Could I have done everything in real terms? You know what I mean by real terms? No inflation in the cash flow. Yeah, I could have done an entirely real NPV, right? Would my net present value have been different? Avisha, I'm going to ask you to turn your mic on and tell me why the, the net present value would not have been different. Lead me through the cash flows and the discount rate. Tell me what's going to happen if I did everything in real terms. Um, I see that because the interest rate and the cash flows both would be adjusted uh, with inflation. So um, like the denominator, the, denominator, the denominator and the numerator would have the same terms in fact in fact the in Abish is absolutely right the best way for you to confirm this is to take the analysis that I did remember I had the the price of iron ore rising at two percent a year which is the inflation rate if you do everything in real terms the price is going to stay a hundred every year for the next 10 years the variable cost was forty five dollars or forty five percent and it wrote it wrote everything is going to now get locked in you're going to get lower cash flows. You do everything in real terms because the inflation is gone, but you'll also have a discount rate that's 2% lower, roughly. Your net present value is not going to change. Again, incredibly good news if you think about it, because what does it say? You can do your analysis in nominal terms or real terms. You can pick any currency you want. And as long as you're consistent, your net present value should not be changed by any of those choices. So, if there are no other questions, I'm going to do a what if on this project. When you're a commodity company, your biggest uncertainty, the one thing you worry most about is what happens if commodity prices change. Think of all those oil companies that eight weeks ago, 10 weeks ago took projects when oil prices were $40 to $30. In fact, before I do that, Rukshan asks, is it better to do real rather than nominal? Because You have to deal with inflation no matter what. It's not gonna make inflation go away. So I would just say do everything in nominal terms because taxes are based on nominal numbers. It's a much cleaner way to do analysis. So I almost never would do things in real terms. So stick with nominal. Just stay consistent with whatever currency you pick. So let's talk about what would happen to this project if the iron ore price, instead of being 100, were 90 or 110. Well, obvious things happen. If my iron ore prices turn out to be higher than expected, my net present value and internal rate of return both go up. If my iron ore prices turn out to be lower than expected, the net present value of the IRR go down. It's a big deal. Uh, I knew that already. And you're right. If all you get is a sense of direction, this tells you absolutely nothing. But there's a break-even price here, right, for iron ore at about $90 a, 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 a ton. 
your net present value turns negative. In other words, if you're Vale and you have a pretty good sense of where iron ore prices have moved in the past, you might say, look, my break-even price on this mine is 89, 90, $90.5. I'm pretty comfortable with that. I'll take this project anyway. Okay? So on a what-if analysis, I'm getting a break-even on the iron ore price. I can also, I also have to worry about exchange rates here. Not hugely volatile ones because the Canadian dollar versus the US dollar. But if the Canadian dollar gets stronger, my net present value gets lower. Think of what? My costs are all in Canadian dollars. My revenues are in US dollars. So if my, the Canadian dollar strengthens, my costs are going up. My revenues are not. I'm going to get squeezed. If the Canadian dollar gets weaker, the NPV. Here again, I can give you a break-even point. If the Canadian dollar gets 17% more or 16% more um, stronger than I thought it would, my net present value turns negative. So with both iron ore prices and with the exchange rate, I can compute break-even points. And here, there is something I can do, right? So clearly, my net present value is a function of iron ore price. It's also a function of exchange rates. I'm going to ask you a question, and this is actually a question that commodity companies, in fact, most companies ask all the time. First, Vale can go out and hedge against future iron ore prices changes, right? So we know iron ore prices are uncertain, but Vale, if it wanted to, could go out and lock in prices using forward markets. Should Vale hedge against iron ore price movements? Wouldn't that depend on the risk appetite in the markets? Well, remember, they, who's they? Vale shareholders. But Vale shareholders, so they actually you're, you're, I think you're honing in on a very important question. But who makes the decision on whether to hedge? Do Vale shareholders make it? The CFO? The managers do. So if you're a manager, would you want to hedge risk? For, forget about the shareholders. Let's say you're a manager. Would you want to hedge risk? Depends on how my compensation is. Exactly. Manager. Depends on how you get compensated and depends on whether you lose your job, the earnings drop and depend. So in a sense, already I want you to start thinking about who makes decisions on, he on hedging and who actually benefits or loses from hedging. If shareholders made decisions on hedging, the way they think about iron ore prices might be, look, I'm investing in an iron ore company. I want to get commodity price movements in my earnings. Remember, if you go out and hedge, against commodity price movements, you're also preventing your shareholders from benefiting if commodity prices go up, right? Because you've cut away that benefit. So if I'm a shareholder, I might say, look, don't hedge. I'm investing in an oil company because I want to bet on oil prices. But if you're a manager at that same company and you're worried about losing your job if something bad happens, you might hedge. You know what else could affect whether you hedge? How much debt you have. Think about what? Why would having debt make a difference in whether you hedge against iron ore or, or oil prices? Debt covenants might require you to be insensitive to price. Well, forget about debt covenants. You could go bankrupt, right? I mean, there are oil companies now that are bankrupt at a $25 oil price. So when you have a lot of debt, you're going to use hedging a lot more than we have less debt. So. First, it's going to depend on managerial risk aversion. Second, it's going to depend on how much debt you have as a company. Third, it might actually depend on your access to capital. You see why access to capital matters? If you're a company with great access to capital, you might be less inclined to use hedging than if you're a company with less access to capital. So smaller companies are more likely to hedge than larger companies. Emerging market companies are more likely to hedge than developed market companies. Already you can see hedging is not a slam dunk. Most people say, well, I should always hedge. That's not true. It depends on what you're hedging against. And in this case, if Vale were thinking from a shareholder's perspective, it probably should not hedge against iron ore prices if it doesn't have a lot of debt and should hedge if it has debt. But on exchange rates, I think it should hedge. And here's why. When I invest in Vale, I don't want the, I, this is not a bet on exchange rate, this is a bet on iron ore prices or commodity prices. So you can already see that the decision you make on what you hedge against and what you hedge on could depend on what, what the variable is, what, the, you know, what you're trying to hedge against and whose perspective you're taking when you're hedging.
So when you think about hedging, you might not care about the Canadian dollar and hedging against the Canadian dollar because it's a pretty stable currency. Because of Brazilian real, you might hedge. So we'll, I'll give you a little framework for deciding when to hedge and whether to hedge. But already I wanted to start thinking about risk and when you want to try to make risk go away and when you should let risk pass through to your investors. Because that's, I think, a big part of risk management. In fact, I have a book called Strategic Risk, risk Management. It's one of the, I, when I wrote the book and my publisher said, can you use strategic in the, in the title? I said, please don't make me do it, but he made me do it anyway. But it's about this decision of how much, what risk should you pass through to shareholders? What risk should you hedge? And what risk should you just avoid, right? So we'll talk about that. I'll give you, you know, so chain asks the question, why does better access to capital reduce the payoff to hedging? Because if you have access to, one of the reasons you hedge is you worry about worst case scenarios that you could go under. The greater the access to capital, the less you worry about going under. So you, you're much more willing to let those risks flow through. Okay. So here's my hedging picture. So you ready? You can pick any risk you want. So wherever you want, think about the risk. And I'm going to take you through the process of whether you should hedge this risk or not and why I'm making the judgments that I did. So first question I ask is what is the cost to the firm of hedging this risk? If you say there's no cost, you know what you should do? Just damn well hedge the risk. I'll tell you how some companies are able to hedge risk without any cost. If you're a retail firm with one store in one location, you have location risk, right? What does that mean? If the busy street that used to run by your store gets shut down, your store is done. But as you open more and more stores in different locations, you hedge location risk. So one of the ways you can hedge risk is by making operating decisions, which there's really no additional cost to you from hedging. So there's no cost. Then ask yourself, is there a benefit? And if there's any benefit at all, just go hedge the risk. Don't ask any more questions. So the cost of hedging is close to zero and you get any kind of benefit, of course you should hedge. But if the cost of hedge, hedging exists, and for most hedging there is a cost, then you could ask, is there a significant benefit to my shareholders? So think from the perspective of shareholders and then we can ask what, what the, the judgment would be if you're a manager. That benefit can either take the form of higher cash flows, maybe because you're saving on taxes, maybe it's because your survival chances increased. Remember we talked about if there's a big risk you could go under, or maybe by hedging, by hedging some macro risk, you can even lower your discount rate. Hedging micro risk will not. So hedging location risk will not reduce your discount rate, but hedging interest rate risk might reduce your discount rate. So cash flow effects, survival effects, discount rate effects, and if there's a significant benefit, then ask yourself, are your marginal investors, the investors in your company, able to hedge this risk cheaper than you can? See, so how can they even do that? I'll give you an example of a risk where your investors might be able to hedge this risk at a much lower cost than you do. Let's say you're a company like Disney. You have projects in Shanghai, your projects in Europe, you have investments you've made in Latin America, you have substantial exchange rate risk, right, as a company. I would argue you should not hedge any of that exchange rate risk and let me explain why. Remember I showed you the top 17 investors in Disney and if you don't count um, Loreen Jobs and, um, and George Lucas who are not marginal investors, the remaining 15 were all big institutional investors. You know, BlackRock is there, you know, State Street, Fidelity. Think from the perspective of BlackRock. BlackRock owns Disney, it also owns 95 other US companies, global companies. Think of what happens when the US dollar strengthens. Some of their companies benefit, some don't. So if you look at a, the cost to BlackRock of hedging exchange rate risk, it's close to zero because it happens almost automatically in their portfolio. So if you're Disney and you go spend money to hedge exchange rate risk, you're costing BlackRock something that they did not have to pay. So many large companies who's with marginal investors with, who are big institutional investors, in my view, hedge too much because that hedging could have been done by their investors at a much lower cost. And by spending money to hedge those costs, they're actually creating double costs for their investors. If you're smaller, your marginal investors are mostly domestic and then go out and compare the benefits you get to the cost. And if the benefits exceed the cost, go out and hedge the risk. 
So if you look at that, this table, basically it starts by asking, is there a cost? If there's no cost and there's a benefit, it's a slam dunk, just hedge the risk. If there's a cost, then you measure the benefits. And if your shareholders can do it cheaper, let them do it. But if you, you're the only one who can really do it, then you should hedge the risk. Every 10 risks that you think about hedging, maybe one should be hedged. But in real life, four to five often hedge. Now, there's one ask if a company has only institutional investors who are, especially if they're global institutional investors, then it shouldn't hedge. It should hedge a lot less. Shouldn't hedge is too strong. There might be some risks that only they can see, their shareholders can't see very well. Like if you have a building that can burn down, of course you should hedge. That's what insurance is. And your shareholders can't do it because they can't even detect the building and see that it's under risk. So there'll be hedging, but there'll be a lot less hedging at those companies. Now, there, I know that, um, that people hedge too much. And the reason they hedge is the people who make decisions and hedging are not shareholders, they're managers. And we talked about how managers tend to be more risk averse than shareholders. They, think, they tend to think a lot more about company specific risk. And I don't blame them for that. And the people selling hedging products play to that, right? So the way you sell a hedging product is you show a manager that if you hedge, your earnings get less volatile, which it does. And then you say, if your earnings get less volatile, your stock price will go up because people will pay a higher price, which actually turns out not to be true. The PE ratios for companies that hedge, you know, in fact, in, in commodity companies, you can actually see commodity companies that hedge versus commodity companies that don't. And there's no payoff in the market to hedging, but the people selling hedging products sell it on that basis. So you can see why people hedge, and but I think they do hedge too much. So. I, I've kind of thrown a lot at you there, so I'm going to give you a chance to ask a question. So if you can no, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask me any questions about hedging. I know some of you might have been the people selling the hedging products. So hit me with your bet, best pitch and I'll give you my best response. Nothing. Have I convinced you so completely already? This is in, in, with all hedging, exchange rates, commodity prices. The, 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 the specific example I gave you about gold mining companies focused on hedging gold prices. And there the payoff is, is not just zero, it's negative. The companies that hedge their forward gold actually do worse than the companies that don't for a simple reason. People invest in gold companies to get a play on gold price. They get really pissed off if you go and undercut that hedging. But it's this particular table you can use for any kind of hedging. Go ahead. Somebody had a mic going? No? Perry, you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah. These are usually airlines who say we play and yep. to generate value by operational efficiency. And then there are others who believe in the, in the improvement of airline capacity. Right. So wouldn't that decision maker, if you're making money, like in, the, in Wale's case, if Wale thinks that they will generate value for shareholders yep. in the most efficient miner, they hedge everything. If they think they're going to make value by buying the right mine. Right. So you, you, you see, one of the benefits that I show in your cash flows is maybe by taking this risk off the table, this worry about exchange rates off the table, Vale's, let's say Vale says, look, we're really good managers of mines. That's our strength. Then maybe you could make the argument you should hedge against iron ore prices. But you know how I'm going to check you on that? I'm going to go check the margins you have on your mines versus the margins that companies that don't hedge have on their mines. And if they're the same, I'm going to say, well, show me the payoff. So I'm willing to listen to a story where managers say, look, our, our strength is doing this. That's why we want to hedge it. And with, with airlines, I'll be quite honest, either hedge or don't hedge. I'll tell you, there are only two company, two airlines in the world that, have, that hedge consistently, Southwest and Singapore Air. You know why, what I mean by hedge, they, they hedge all the time. Most airlines use the worst possible mix. They hedge when they choose to hedge and they stop hedging when they feel they don't have to. And unfortunately for them, their timing sticks. They stop hedging exactly when they should start hedging and they start hedging exactly when they should stop. 
So make a decision on hedging. And I can understand if you're an airline that you want predictable fuel costs. You know why Southwest wants predictable fuel costs? Because if you've ever flown Southwest, unlike other airlines, their fares don't go up and down. They don't have discount fares. They try to make their fare structure predictable. And if you want to have a predictable fare structure, you need predictable costs. Southwest is going to pay a price for that hedging in the next six months, right? Because oil prices have dropped, but they've hedged at maybe $45 oil prices. So there's a, there's a penalty sometimes you pay, but for Southwest, from an operational standpoint, I, I completely understand the rationale for hedging fuel costs. But with Vale, they make that argument, I don't think it flies. Thank you. Avisha asks, if a company does not have a, everybody has a marginal investor, Avisha, it's, it's a question of who the marginal investor is. If you're a, a privately owned company, you are the marginal investor as the owner. And guess what? You're going to hedge like crazy because this is your entire wealth. So privately owned companies tend to hedge a lot and who can blame them? If all your wealth is, is riding on this one company, you better hedge against that risk. Professor, for, uh, when we're talking about hedging here, is it, can you just partially hedge or is this yeah. all like it's not all or nothing. You can, for instance, if you have a lot of debt, you can say, look, I want to hedge at least 30% of my production because that will give me enough cash flows to cover my debt payments. You can do it strategically. You, and I'm using the word strategically in the best possible sense. So it's, it's not an all or nothing. So, but I, when I say less versus more, think of it as a continuum of to where you want to be in that no hedging at all to I'm going to hedge everything. And I think where you fall will depend on what kind of company you are, who your marginal investors are, what your access to capital is, how much debt you have. All those things are going to determine whether you fall towards the 15% or the 85%. Hey, professor, so if, if the cost uh, that you are trying to hedge is a large part of the cost is that, that makes it very catastrophic for large volatility, like for example, oil costs for airlines, so if a, interest rates for high interest. Yeah. It is catastrophic only because you have a fixed cost that you have to meet, right? So this is the extension of the leverage argument. For, uh, for it to become catastrophic, there has to be a fixed cost you have to cover. So if you have high operating or financial leverage, it could be catastrophic. And there you have to hedge at least enough to survive. No, no, actually we're not. Actually, when we bring in the marginal investor, we're looking at it in the context of a portfolio, right? So I'm sorry, okay, but keep going. So we are looking at whether a company should hedge risk, but we're bringing in the perspective of investors in multiple companies. Right. For example, if the marginal investor was BlackRock and they had a position in uh, Adidas as well as Nike, uh, there would be a comparison by that marginal investor as to who's outperforming, right? Through analysis projections and their estimations. But, and I, I uh, recall go, reading a couple yeah. of experiences of Adidas missing their profits and citing, you know, large currency fluctuations, right? And that, that kind of bubbled into the analysis review of both Adidas and Nike and whether or not Adidas is going to have long-term growth, right? Yeah. Wouldn't that translate it, into... Yeah, that's a good, it's a good question, right? It's an, it's an empirical question. It's an empirical question of whether companies that hedge, which will have less volatile earnings, are priced higher by markets, right? Because if your story holds, it should show up in more volatile earnings, and more volatile earnings should lead to a higher risk, and higher risk means you get punished with a lower PE. That's where looking at the studies actually, because that's, the, that's what you hear CFO say. If we don't hedge, we're going to get punished by institutional investors. Do you know that, that when you have earnings announcements, it's actually very, it's very transparent sometimes to see why companies miss earnings because they actually tell you what their earnings would have been before the currency effect and after. So there have been studies that looked at earnings surprises where the entire negative surprise is due to exchange rate movements. To see if markets punish companies where they fall below expectations simply because exchange rates moved in the wrong way. And you know what these studies find? That if your earnings surprise is entirely due to exchange rate movements, you neither get rewarded if you get a positive surprise or punish. So sometimes the conventional wisdom in this is based on anecdotal evidence. And the, if you look across companies, 
it's much weaker. So I'm not saying it's not a legitimate thing to bring into the analysis, but I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that hedging is going to get me rewarded by BlackRock because I'll have more stable earnings because the evidence doesn't seem to back that up. And remember, BlackRock, when it makes its decision on invest, might be comparing Adidas to Nike. But when it's looking at its portfolio, it's looking at what 500 companies and it looks at how did exchange rates play out across my 500 companies. Any last questions? So before I leave, because we're not going to meet till Monday, I'm going to send you a couple of emails today. I know mean, you have nothing in your hands. You're sitting at home anyway, so I'll just keep hitting you with more and more emails. One about the class and the, and the promise links, and the other about the case, and perhaps give you a little bit of guidance on that studio that has to be built, because I think that's where there's some confusion. So I'll send you some of that. and um, And... As you start working on the case, if you get stuck, you know, have no qualms about sending me an email about what you're stuck on and what your question is, and I'll be glad to answer it. But thank you for joining me. I mean, at the, you know, as I said, stay safe, and um, I will see you next Monday.